Hello and welcome to the Little Knowledge Podcast, where this time we'll be talking about the Lost Gear House. It'll be a tale of balloons, burglary and tragedy. Uh, my name is Paul Busby and with me, as always, is Gough Morgan. Hello, Gough. Hello. Hello. Greetings to you. How's How are we all doing? Fine and dandy, to a degree. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a disclaimer. There's always a... You know, yeah, within the parameters of fine and dandiness, I am more or less snuggling in there, more or less, yeah. <laughs> yeah what did you think bit... about our, tri our virtual trip to Glamorgan two weeks ago for St. Donald's I, Castle? I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I, I was, yes, I, I, there was so much more about it I didn't realise. I mean, I knew all the William Randolph Hearst stuff, but I didn't know, you know, the, the, the extent of the earlier history of it. And again, the straddling murder? Mm-hmm-hmm. <laughs> Well, the straddling death. Yeah, we're not sure about that. Very shaky. A couple yeah. of interesting things, though, about that is I saw a video, of course, after we recorded the podcast, from well. someone who worked there under William Randolph Hearst. Oh, he gosh. He told the story. They had a film night. The film hadn't been released yet, obviously. Yeah. And they set it up in the hall of St. Donat's Castle. And you know what Hearst was like of buying these, I would say priceless, but I think Hearst found out that everyone had his price when it came yeah. to Hearst. Yeah. He had this wonderful furniture, didn't he? He had this mm. marvellous Elizabethan table in the hall as they were watching the film. Well, as the film went on, it was a musical. And Marion Davis got slightly fidgety and she yeah. started saying, well, that's wrong. That dance routine is wrong. This is how they should have done it. Jumped up <laughs> onto the Elizabethan table, which <laughs> had just bought and started dancing on it. <laughs> the face of William Randolph Hearst can be imagined. He had a limit. <laughs> but we had some kind replies of it. My, one of my favorite ones was Gareth Rees, who actually lived at St. Donat's for 26 years. So oh. he knows the place inside out. He was the vice principal, I think, of Atlantic College. Oh, gosh. And he got in touch very kindly to inform us about uh, a feature of uh, Bradenstoke Hall, the controversial Bradenstoke Hall, as we mentioned. And that's the fact that one of the fireplaces and Hearst would sometimes cut down fireplaces to fit. You know, he brought in oh. all these 16th century French fireplaces all yeah. around. But that meant that sometimes he had fireplaces in places without actually chimney breasts or chimneys. They were false fireplaces. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Gareth Reese says that, yes, that is why the chimney breast on one of the fireplaces in Bradenstoke Hall is a bit cardboardy. Yeah, right. Yeah. So there's a bit of a contrivance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we're back closer to home today, aren't we? Oh, oh uh, we, we are. I never even knew that such a venue had existed. Well, it's it's uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I hope that some people will agree with you on that, because it's, of course, named after this. <coughs> the Iron Age Hill Fort. Ah, uh, yeah. Of course, Gare, of course, uh, uh, was from, is from the Welsh word Gaia for fort. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and there it is. And you can see now the uh, the Gare estate right on its uh, Oh, yeah. Well, it's lower slopes, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating thing, that, that because you can remember an awful lot of the land to the south of the Gaia is reclaimed land, was well, reclaimed by the seawalls that went up. Hmm. So it's possible that when the fort was obviously built, uh, below it was either a lot, a lot of very marshy land, and, and in fact also that the sea may have come up closer to it as well. So it means it was a much more defensible spot. And it is possible... Um, that the gear itself, the guy, is what gave the name to the land that became Tredegar House and Tredegar Estate. Yeah, it's a possibility. Because, uh, yeah, this Tredegar means land at the foot of the fort. Yeah. I'd possibly reclaimed land at the foot of the fort, so it comes in after that point as well. Oh, yeah, so oh, Troid, Troidagaya, yes, means yeah. that. Tread is feet, apparently. Troid is foot, but you're quite right. The way it could, right. be, it could have been distorted. Troid, yeah. So it's really, it's, uh, it's a very significant lump, the guy. Certainly is. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and actually, interestingly, from everything from poems and all the bits, it's, it has taken it from Gaia, but is pronounced by all and sundry, Gaia. Yeah, Every yeah. historical uh, bit, at least the estate, yeah. the house is, the house is, yeah. I'll say that much. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, Tredegar, um, mm. It was very much part of uh, the park landscape. Well, there is a map in oh, 1770 
showing a double avenue of trees leading from Tredegar House all the way up to what got the name then Tredegar Hill Fort, and then oh, an oh. avenue of oak trees going all the way to Bay's Leg from the Hill Fort. Oh, so how interesting. It was part of the uh, of the, the landscaping of uh, the Morgan's Tredegar Park. But and, which, uh, was, which was at some point a thousand acres, wasn't it? So it was a massive, it would have I mean, taken in that, that, that fort. Oh, absolutely. It was a very yeah, large cool. place. Amazing. And here we can actually see Tredegar Park with Keeper yeah. Hazel, with his Lordship Spaniels, and you can uh, see in the background. Yeah. There it is. Um, the... I'm, I'm right, I'm right. I think there's one of the small panel paintings in the gilt room uh, also features the gear as well, doesn't it? It's a debate. We haven't got a clue oh, what they are. <laughs> oh. Italian, some say, and others say it looks a bit Welsh. I think, I think it looks more <laughs> like that referencing the local properties, local area myself. You might the be right. very much like the Garys. It, it was a far too much coincidence that they dabbed on an Italian landscape that happened to look like the Garys. <laughs> <laughs> you, might, you might be right. Uh, the lower slopes before the estate uh, were used as uh, Lord Tredegar's deer park um, for quite a while. And what is oh, now what? known as Tredegar Park, as opposed to Tredegar House, was mm. part of the deer park as well. Um, and but later years, it became again not the top of the fort. Obviously, it's a bit steep. It was part of Tredegar Park Golf Course, oh, which right. is why to this day the fort is known locally as the yeah. Golf Links or the Gollers. That's what the Gollers locally. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it is an intriguing place. Um, yeah. Now, what we like to do because this is the third. Do you realise this golf? This is the third in our Lost Houses series after oh. Clanwern, St. Julian's, and now the Gare. And so yeah. I'd like, because the house is lost, we can't give you its address. So I'd like to yeah. show you exactly where it is rather right. than guesswork. And how I'm gonna do it is by a wonderful handy dandy feature on the National Museum of Scotland website. Okay, so yeah. what, we, what it, it allows you to do is to transpose old maps onto new. Right, yeah. So this is a map from about 1900. OK, and yeah. you can actually see what I mean. It looks here as if you can still see in 1900 one of the old avenues lead into the gear. Oh, yes, you can house. make that out. Yes, you can just yeah. see that. Yes, that's so fascinating. But for our bit, we are here. Now, I hope you can see that quite clearly. Um, oh, yeah, there's the word lodge. The lodge. Is that the lodge gate to the house, is it? Yes. And what we have here, uh, where I'm running the cursor, is essentially modern day Cardiff Road. Right. So this lodge here leads into Gear Road. In fact, this lodge still exists. Oh, there really? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I've seen so that got, many a time. Yeah. Got Tesco, Tesco over this side, yeah. and uh, that leads up to Gear Road. So that lodge still exists. It winds all the way up. Yeah. As you can see, uh, the Oaks is another interesting loss, isn't it? The Oaks yeah. is where the house is on Cardiff Road. Now, well, that was a large family house, yeah. but the Gear was a large mansion. And there you see the gear yeah. and causing much confusion to a lot of people to this day, including Wikipedia, it would seem, is that there was also Gaia Vach, which is yeah. little gear. Little gear, yeah. But this is the main one. Now, if we use this. So was can... little gear connected with the big house? Yes, it was. It was the farm. Ah, I like it. It usually had a, a tenant. Now, right. handy dandy magic, we can transpose the 21st century onto this map. And you can see. Oh yeah. Here we are. All oh, right. Oh right. So the actual ah. point, you got Lansdowne Road here in the Gear Estate. So this bit here, where all the gardens meet on Lansdowne yeah. Road, was the site of the Gear Mansion. Oh right. It's a handy dandy little tool, isn't That's it? That's really very useful. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh yeah. You, oh yes. You see, it sits right on it. Yeah. So all good fun. So yeah, so and it's interesting how the, the road is relayed underneath rather than over the top. That, that, oh, look at that. And the poor old oaks down here is, of course, completely uh, subsumed yeah. by housing, but there, that's yeah. why we've got oaks close. Oh, oh God. Where the oaks used to be. Yeah. So I quite like vanished houses. Yeah. So that's what, I mean, it really is on its own, isn't it? Yeah. The gear, the gear house is absolutely on its own, apart from the farm. Yeah. 
So has Guy of Guy of Vach gone then? Guy of Vach gone? No, we shall come to it later in an oh. exciting reveal. <gasps> <laughs> Thank um, God I was sitting down, I could have swooned. Oh, I tell you. <laughs> Only geeks would find it interesting, but it's there. <laughs> but there are mistakes, people. I mean, Wikipedia gets it all wrong, but I mean, honest historical mistakes are absolutely fine by my book. I'm sure we've made a yeah. few in these podcasts. Now, the original house, the original gear house was Elizabethan. That's the first oh, right. house on that spot. And it was done by the Says family. And in a nice hook from our previous podcast, they were quite big in Llantwick Major for a while near St. Donat's Castle. Oh, and right. they, they knew the Stradlins. I mean, the original says, uh, you could say it's Aeneas says, who was held hostage by William the Conqueror for the good conduct of Glamorgan. So, oh, bloody. Very old family. Yeah, yeah telling me. But our one was Alexander says, who was the son of Roger, Attorney General of all Wales. So they were quite an interesting family. You yeah. can see, however, why the says decided to get away from Clantwick Major and get to a defendable point in Newport up above mm. because yeah. they had problems in Tudor Flantwick Major uh, with the Stradlins. They accused the Stradlins at Star Chamber, Edward Stradlin, of trying to murder Says's mother and servants while they were on a picnic in 1596. <laughs> <laughs> but the Stradlins and the Says became allies when the Van brothers rolled into town. Now, the Van Brothers make me think either the Craze or even the Driscoll Brothers from Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> the Van Brothers turned up and for reasons which are not recorded in Star Chamber, decided to attack the Says. Again, the Says family left church where they were attacked by knives and oh, sticks please. by the Van Brothers. It's so, an astonishing period, this, isn't it? It's certainly not in any way refined. You know, these right. are gangland bosses, aren't they? It's very it's rough. So what, about it. <coughs> what they did was they took refuge in Hopkin App Reese's house. Oh, me. And they're only uh, saved by their old enemy, Edward Stradlin, who turned up to arrest the Van Brothers. It was decided that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Hmm. And they decided to work together to get rid of the Van Brothers, which they did. The Vans ended up in the fleet prison and were given an enormous fine, which financially yeah. crippled them. So... Yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> Say's family, a son of Alexander Say's, is the one that yeah. built uh, the first gear house. And they carry on their high sheriffs and that sort of thing. The last Say's to live at the gear was William Say's in 1738, and his daughter Florence married, very grand name, Mr. Montonier Hawkins. Montonier Hawkins. Montonier Hawkins. He was a doctor. A lot of, yeah. the, uh, a lot of them were doctors, the Montonier Hawkins. And uh, here he is. Here's Alexander. Ah. Now, what he did was important was he completely renovated and rebuilt Gear House, which means that he got rid of all the Elizabethan bits. So basically knocked it down and rebuilt it. Yeah. Whether he made a good job of it or not is debatable. I mean, somebody said he actually created a house with no notable architectural features whatsoever, which is <laughs> <was> an achievement. <laughs> and here it is. It's a bit blocky. You can see it from oh. the back. You can see it up yeah. above. Uh, but we've got a better picture of it, although taken much later and after much uh, improvements. There's the gear house. Oh, there we are. So what period was that? Do you know? Well, this is, is quite late. This is about 1900. Ah, oh, right. Oh. But it was the start of the century, about 1800, yeah. that all this was altered and gear house appeared in its form that you can see today. Uh, the Montagnier Hawkins disappeared. Uh, and uh, they moved out and uh, 1824, someone else moved in whose name is absolutely synonymous with the gear throughout the coal fields of South Wales. And indeed the world, he was known as Powell of the gear, the mighty Thomas Powell. Now, Thomas Powell moved in a fascinating character. One of the key figures in Newport history is Thomas mm. Powell. So he moves into the gear, he adds improvements to it, and he was a self-made man. Yeah. When he decided he was going to work uh, in coal, he bought an area with coal, got a shovel, got a pick, and worked the mine himself to learn the business. Good God. Very much old school. However, oh, yeah. he was an extremely ruthless, tough, burly individual with a oh, yeah. very loud voice that would sort of bawl the odds. You didn't mess 
with Thomas Powell. Yeah. In his early days, <clears throat> because he didn't have the money, he had to do something that he hated in later life. He had to have a partnership. Mm. And the partner he chose was an old friend of this channel, oh, Mr. Oh, Thomas yeah. Prothero of Malpas Court. Uh, oh, dear me. Yes. Yeah, it's talk about, you know, the, 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 the huge aggressive bruiser going in with a complete legal crook. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Although I think yeah. Prothero found out that the one man he shouldn't cross was Thomas yeah. Powell. Um, Powell oh, yeah, was no, he, was a, he was quite a uh, physically aggressive man as well, wasn't he? I'm, I'm led to believe he yeah. was a physically intimidating man. You know, he was a, a, quite a bruiser. Yes, he was. <laughs> yeah. Powell was. But Powell excluded everything from his life except business. So unlike Sir Charles Morgan of Tredegar, there were no aristocratic pretensions. He didn't want a knighthood or a peerage. Unlike Thomas Prothero of Malpas Court, he had no political. Uh, he didn't want power. He didn't want politics. Business was all. So every penny he made, he almost, almost certainly reinvested it into the business. If you look at census records of Gear House, it's a very unostatious living. He gets by with the minimum amount of servants required, it seems to me. Oh, that's interesting. So he's very different. He's came to Newport with he was either born in Chepstow or Monmouth, it's not clear. And he came to Newport as a timber merchant, but soon got into coal. It was at Getley Gear in 1829 where he was had his first success, where he uh, had two shafts there. Um, he did show in that he could be tough with Prothero and Latch did produce the Newport Coal Association, which was a coal ring to control prices. Yeah, a coal the cartel, monopoly. essentially. Exactly. Yeah, they had the monopoly on it, didn't they? It was a Let's cartel. You're yeah, quite yeah. right. But he was told that <clears throat> he should go towards, he decided that it was all all right house coal, um, but he knew that steam coal was probably the future. And he was told near Merthyr is where people were, were digging shafts and mining for this, not the Aberdeer Valley. But Powell decided to take the road less taken, and that made all the difference. Because in 1840, he decided to have mines in Aberdeer. He sank the plough, and the, the name that became synonymous with Powell, other than the gear, the Lower Dufferin, the Middle Dufferin, and it was a phenomenal success. To say that he outgrew Thomas Prothero is only putting it mildly. He yeah. became the largest shipper of house coal in Cardiff and Newport, and he wasn't finished yet. Oh, yeah. Right. He decided to cut out the middlemen. So he owned his own coastal vessels. He got involved as an early director of the Taff Valley, Taff Vale Railway. So he controlled how it was transported as well as how it was dug. Yeah. So he knew exactly what he was doing. He yeah. had his uh, offices in Dock Street in Newport, where he created this vast coal empire for himself. To put into perspective, Goff, it was very rare. If you ran a coal mine, as opposed to owning it and leasing it like the Morgans, yeah. if you owned a coal mine, you usually concentrated on one. At his peak, Powell owned 16 pits. Yes. He was a mighty uh, a man, and he enjoyed thwarting his rivals. He enjoyed <laughs> it. John Nixon was a big name. I mean, yeah. Thomas Prothero uh, got his start by being agents to the aristocracy, didn't he? Yeah. Primarily Tredegar, Sir Charles Morgan, but also John Nixon's estate he ran, who was a, uh, a mining engineer, and also <laughs> Chemis, another name we've mentioned on our yeah. Kevin Mabley podcast. <clears throat> and, uh, John Nixon decided it might be a good idea if France bought South Wales steam coal rather than the Newcastle steam coal that they were currently buying. So yeah. he approached Powell and said, look, if you can supply the coal, I can get over there and convince the French. Powell agreed. Nixon yeah. headed over and he put a lot of his money into it, a lot of his time, a lot of his work. But after three years, Powell refused to pay Nixon. <sighs> Nixon wondered why, and Powell decided that he found that this partnership appeared to be more beneficial to Nixon, and Powell yeah. was not having that. Yeah. In a partnership, you do not do better than Thomas yeah. Powell, and Nixon eventually squeezed £300 from him, uh, yeah. and then he said, well, what about legal action against you, Mr. Powell? And this is when Powell said this direct quote. Now, Mr. Nixon, 
I was never afraid of the law. I have had a lawsuit with Lord Bute, and I beat him, and I will <laughs> beat you too. I hear you talk of agreements. I never in my life made an agreement that I could not get out of, and all <laughs> that are against me, I do get out of. <laughs> you really didn't want to mess with this man. No, no. But there were, no. I mean, at its peak, I mean, he became uh, so vast, his empire, so great that it wasn't just Cardiff and Newport. It was said that he was shipping 700,000 tons of coal, which meant that Mr. Thomas Powell of the Gear had a say in being the largest coal shipper and exporter in the entire world. Yeah, that, that's astonishing, isn't it? Absolutely astonishing. Uh, from, you know, yeah, someone who just bought one thing <laughs> at the beginning and started hacking away at it himself virtually. And I think <laughs> to end up being in that situation is incredible. However, the you drive, make enemies. The drive of that man must have been astonishing. Oh, he was you know, always. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, he must have been a, a, a yeah, steamroller. You wouldn't want to get in the way of him, would you? You would Good not, God. because this was his life. This was his passion. Yeah. This was everything. And But you make enemies with your ruthlessness, and Powell certainly did. Infamously, in 1848, you should have been careful. That was the year of revolutions in Europe. Yeah. Uh, he convinced the other coal owners to cut wages by 15%. And there was a strike. Yeah. And this turned up at Gare House front door. This is from the Cambrian newspaper, 1848, OK? <laughs> it's a lovely response. <clears throat> a report is in circulation, although we do not vouch for the truth of it that a coffin was found at the door of Gare House near <laughs> Newport on Tuesday morning last with a plate <laughs> on it containing Mr. Powell's name and the <laughs> date when he is to die. <laughs> the gentleman is a large, let's put it slightly, the, the <laughs> gentleman is a large colliery proprietor and it is supposed that some of the colliers engaged in the strike are the parties who placed it there. And then they have this weaselly, grovelly bit. Yeah. Mr. Powell is a very good neighbour and is beloved by every respectable person who knows him. <laughs> <laughs> now he, uh... <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Powell married three times, uh, only had children from his third wife, Anne, who was born in Bristol, but was a widow, uh, moved from London. Uh, he had three sons and three daughters. And Powell did buy his eldest son, Thomas Jr., quite a nice wedding present. He built, by his own money, this place, the Cauldra. Oh. Thomas Powell built the Cauldra, which later became oh, yeah. the maternity hospital, which, of course, That's later right. became Celtic Manor. Manor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, That's... gosh. Well, well, well. He gets everywhere, does Thomas Powell. Yeah. Um, extremely wealthy man, extremely formidable man. You can sort of see why, quite frankly, Prothero didn't want to push him too far. I mean, after the death of Prothero, Powell proved that there was absolutely no sentiment when he charged Prothero's sons through the nose to use some of the property that they both owned in partnership. <laughs> oh, no, don't mess with uh, don't mess with Mr. Thomas. Uh, Powell. Yeah. Now, he died in 1863. He was yeah. 83 years of age, and he was working in his, in his Docks uh, uh, Road office in Newport till his dying day. Oh, God. He's 83, he's still working. Yeah. He has a heavy cold, cold, 24th of March, 1863. He goes back to the gear, dies at the age of 83. Okay. Now, of course, the, the, the three sons continued for a bit, but then they quickly sold his company, <laughs> quickly yeah. sold it just to Sir George Eliot, who was putting together a company which became the mighty Powell Dufferin Company, yeah. coal and steam, which still is going today. Powell Dufferin today is in charge of ports. Uh, oh, logistics wow. for ports. So, oh, his, gosh. so yeah. the empire still lives yeah. on. Good. But as you know, Goff, uh, it, the story didn't end with the death of Thomas Powell, did it? Oh, I mean, even no, his no, death no. caused slight issues involving his will. So if I put on the yeah. next photo, which is a wonderful photograph of Gear House. Yeah. Oh, hey. And if you can take up the story, that would be great. Well, it becomes very, very intriguing. After he dies, obviously, there is a lot of money floating around for the family. 
Uh, there, again, there are 16 mines. They're all various things. There's the, coal, the, the, the docks investments, everything. So the property is due to be split up between the sons, the three sons um, who are in charge of it. His two younger sons and another gentleman were the executors of the will. His oldest son wasn't. And it's going to be dis dis distributed. They actually have, after he dies, a reading of the will to the family. Now, this is intriguing because it's always presumed that the reading of the will is a, is a fiction. It doesn't actually happen. Well, in this case, it did happen. They did gather at oh, the gear right. and they did read the will to the family. Um, but this will becomes extremely significant because it gets stolen. Ooh, fascinating. A fascinating set of circumstances crop up. Um, if we look at the consulting the Monmouthshire Merlin um, for 23rd of May, 1863, daring robbery, some considerable alarm was created at the Gare House, the residence of Mrs. Powell, early on Saturday morning last, by the discovery on the servants entering the drawing room that one window was thrown up, with the shutters wide open, and on further examination of the other rooms, several writing desks, drawers, and an iron safe were found to be open, and the contents in confusion. The gentlemen were at once aroused and soon satisfied themselves that some person had managed to conceal himself in the house on the previous evening, who, after ransacking the rooms on the ground floor, had retired by the window which he had opened from within. A messenger was immediately dispatched to the police station, went Inspector Shepherd. We've met Inspector Shepherd a number of times in some of our crimes that we've had. We is it the same one? Wow. Yeah, it is. It's the same <laughs> Inspector Shepherd. I think he was down at he was involved in um the Clan Worm murder, and I think he crops up in the in Clan Romney as well. Oh, he does. Uh, he deserves a Morse series, doesn't he? He does, doesn't he? Really? Yeah, yeah. Shepherd yeah. of Newport. Yeah, Shepherd of Newport. Um, so he and the constable pop up to the gear. There's no clue to be found it, and he comes to the conclusion that the house had actually been broken out of, not broken into. Now this becomes quite significant as we go through. So remember that little fact. Uh, you know, the house is in disarray. Um, but he convinced that the way this is done is someone has broken out of the building, not into it. Now, they, the Powells decide that they, um, they want to, they, they thought the, the, the crime had taken place because it had tied in with payday for the colliery and somebody presumed that the money was in the safe. Um, so they put out, but they, nothing was actually taken really and of any great value, but nobody's taking, you know, gold up this silverware or anything like this. But they put out a reward because the one thing that's missing are, was referred to in, the, in this report as various documents of no value to anyone but the family. And they offer a reward of £10 and a further 50 quid on the conviction of the thief. Because basically one of the documents that's gone missing is, is Powell's will. Now this could have caused an enormous amount of problem for the family because obviously they, they, there's so much money floating around in this yeah. place that to try and sort it out without knowing where it should go you end up in contesting cases all sort of things so it's no significant time afterwards which makes you think that somehow the person they, they the people who have nicked this and broken in don't necessarily understand its significance because it's not until june that a letter arrives addressed to Mrs. Powell hmm. from the magnificently named Brothers Laverna. <laughs> <laughs> the Brothers Laverna letters. And the letters are trained out to June. Begin, respected madam, we perhaps merit the utmost possible contempt you or the world may throw upon us, but we trust you will overcome your repugnance sufficient to peruse and comply with the ensuing our only possible stipulation for the restoration of the late Mr. Powell's original will and other documents of a more or less intrinsic value. So basically, they're going to sell them back to her. Whoever's nicked them is basically going to say, right, you know, pay us and you're going to have it back. Mm. Which indicates to me that they do actually really know what the value is, because they ask for a total of £125 in gold. Now, well, that's a significant sum. At this period of time, if you had a hundred pound a year income, you could keep a servant. Yeah. So that's a, more than an annual, a good annual income, what we say. Mm -hmm. So they said, if you, are, I'd love to be, if you are interested, please insert in the start of Gwent for the July the fourth, the following advertisement: John Anderson may apply to his late employers. Should this appear, you will be soon here from us, and please hold the money in readiness. We remain yours respectfully. 
brothers Laverna. <laughs> now, this is very, very, very fast. It goes on. Eventually, a second letter turns up. After this, they agree that they're going to pay this money. And then the second adds up, respected madam, we thank you for your kind and liberal compliance with our last. I love the wonderful, polite formality of these letters. So basically they set it up. They go on Friday, the 11th of July, half past 10 precisely. They said you're to leave the house, the gear, take in with you 125 pound in gold, proceed in the direction of Tredega Park by way of the Cardiff Road, and you will, which you will receive by descending the lane adjacent to the gear. Um, there you will actually be he said should you not be accosted before you reach the bridge a slightly unfortunate phrase that <laughs> which spans the river near the park you will please return and then exchange may take place so basically they're going to meet on the bridge at the bottom of the, the lane um it's a wonderful little bit because obviously they want to make sure that they know they can identify her. it's not just a random lady walking down the lane so he says will you also observe the following little item for though your person is familiar to us it is necessary that you should, during your walk, burden yourself with a slight asthmatic cough. This <laughs> <laughs> must be repeated every half dozen steps or so. Oh, now, boy. This, now, this is doubtless a very disagreeable task for any woman to perform, especially <laughs> one of refined feelings and education. Oh. But our personal safety dictates the above. And all we can do to remove or appease your fears, we do in not having any objection to you being accompanied by a female friend or servant. We remain, madam, yours respectfully, the brothers Laverna. <laughs> now this, again, so they, what happens is they, they <laughs> the family decide that they can't really get away with this, you know, but they can't just let her go off. So a uh, Mr. Williams, who was a friend of the family and one of the executors decides, right, well, what we're going to do he will dress up as Mrs. Powell. <laughs> so getting into full drag, he can get, you know, heads off down towards this area with one, with a, one of the, the family servants beside him, a female servant beside him. And, and, and off they go down to, to get this. Because when they get there, I mean, this is a wonderful, I mean, how the whoever's interviewing him doesn't realise that it is in fact, uh, you know, him dressed up in drag and nobody knows. So he, but eventually they get there and they have a quick chat and they, and Mr. Williams in the guise of Mrs. Uh, Powell decides that he's not going to hand over the money at the moment because he wants to know that they're genuine. He wants some proof. So after a little further conversation, you know, Laverna, the brother Laverna, who was there, agrees to send Mrs. Powell part of lost papers by post and then have a second meeting, a meeting on the, the following Monday. So again, the letters that these things turn up. Um, interestingly, one of the documents that they send to prove that they got out of the safe is actually um, a pocketbook that has a letter inside it. And the letter comes from Major Stack. Now, it doesn't sound significant in its own right, but it's intriguing because Major Stack was the commanding officer of the 45th Regiment who was in the Westgate Hotel and he was part of the soldiers that shot mm. the Chartist, mm. right, the Chartist Uprising. Mm. So, that, so that's intriguing. It was written three years after the, the charge, uh, after the, um, the uprising, rather. Um, so it's interesting to wonder what was in that letter for Major Stack, that he has to actually keep it in the safe. And why pa Why had, uh, did Powell have it? And why with? did Powell have it? It's a, That's a, a little wonder that gives many sort of unanswered questions about this. So eventually they get they, they prove that it's right, they get in contact again, and then they head off to this, the, the third uh, meeting, the second meeting, rather, the third of the letters, to get down here. So they head down the lane. The police have stationed policemen everywhere, including several labourers and a gentleman with a gun. <laughs> is, it, is this a member of the public with a gun? I mean, they would, you can't imagine the police actually doing it now. You know, pretty much them putting the police out, but not getting like, you know, a couple of labourers in. And um, have you got a gun? Yeah, you stand over there. Is that bizarre? So they set up this thing, and um, and as they're going through, a PC hail is climbs over a hedge, and he literally bumps into a man with a mask on. Standing, he's got a hat, he's got a veil over his face, a cloth cap over the top of the veil, and a handkerchief tied around the top. That the looks like a brother legs. Laverna to me. That's, that's one of the brothers Laverna. So PC hail leaps on him. Um, there's a, been a bit of a scrap. The <laughs> the guy they're grabbing you know, starts the throttle Hale and nearly gets him unconscious. But eventually Hale gets her down, sits on him and belts him incredibly hard several times with a truncheon. At which point, yeah, the brother Laverna gives up. 
But also he says this the wonderful this wonderful line, which I get. Um, well, if I get to it now, it's it's a, a large article. Give me a moment. Yeah, when apprehended, he said he's discovered that he used to be a Mr. Edwin Trustcotter Gill, son of Mr. Gill, a carver and gilder of Commercial Street in Newport. And when they found it, they get him off the ground. He goes, "Oh Lord, I am the victim of others. I know nothing of the papers." And he's also claimed the documents belong to a large man called William Matthews, a big man with a beard. Who said basically it's always a bigger boy's fault? Basically, yeah, it was the big boy did it and ran off defense, as we <laughs> like to think about it. So, so eventually, so they drag, they, they drag a girl in, a girl in, and it gets the you know to court, and of course, it, it does go to trial. Um, there's a wonderful little sequence when they, they're in there, and of course, this, this is big news, they love this, you know. That, that, again, we we're talking about how crime was part of the entertainment industry for the Victorian uh, populace, you know, people just flood into the court to see, to see Gill standing there. He said, on being placed at the bar to answer the charge, attracted the eager scrutiny of the crowd. He is a young man of about 18 years of age, of a sallow complexion, dark hair, slightly built, but evidently possessed of a well-knit frame and capable of great activity. His face bore evidence of the fierce encounter in which he had been engaged with Sergeant Hale on the night of the capture. His eyes were much bruised and discoloured and several plasters indicated injuries on his forehead, cheeks and head inflicted by the truncheon of the officer. So basically him a damn good bloody pasty, but when he, when he was trying to throttle him. Um, but again, this is like, this is, ooh, sensation. Apparently he was a uh, gill in the dock was calmer than most of the people in the court around him, apparently. So there's this little bit discussion then between the, the bench, the magistrate and Mr. Fox, um, uh, who basically, oh no, Mr. Fox is the prosecutor who says he's not actually ready. Can they have a deferment because he hasn't got the evidence ready? So the chair of the magistrates for when is it be ready on a Thursday? And the Fox goes, well, I'm not sure. I'm asking, could you do Wednesday? At which point, Mr. Cathcart, who's the solicitor for Gill, says, I'm sorry, I can't do Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> could we possibly do next Thursday? I've got an engagement. So after a bit of a chat, they decide, well, we could do oh, Saturday. No. So the, <laughs> the whole thing gets put back. And he said, the turn which the proceedings has taken was evidently anything but agreeable to the crowded auditory, who appear to have come brimful of anticipation as to the startling revelations which public report said is to be made on this occasion. And manifesting a good deal of chagrin, they slowly dispersed, determining, however, not to miss the opportunity on Saturday next of being present at the examination of the prisoner. So, no, <laughs> so again, this, this, this attracts great attention, this case. Um, the case is, is fascinating due to many things. I mean, they, they, the, break, you know, the breakdown of what happens in the house is very, very intriguing. So they, they talk about, you know, they believe that somebody was hidden under dust covers uh, throughout the day. Um, but obviously they identified that it couldn't have, if it was hiding under dust covers, it couldn't have been between five and nine because of the way the house had been in operation. Um, um, and they then talk about the fact, you know, that a, a, um, an article of fabric called a diaper cloth had been taken from a linen cupboard, though the linens there were more valuable than the cloth itself. Um, this cloth turns up in Gill's home. Um, a pair of boots disappear. It's apparently Gill is seen walking around in for three months. Though when presented to Thomas, uh, Thomas Powell, uh, Jr., um, says that they, they might be his shoes, but he'd only had them two days before they were stolen, so he couldn't quite be sure. So they couldn't quite tell. Um, so they go through all of this, and uh, talking about the burglary and the break-in and what was taken. And then it gets very interesting because Mr. Smythes, who is Gill's barrister, really picks apart the crime scene incredibly well and points out there are a great number of problems about it. One is this. Imagine you're going to do a burglary in a large house of which you know nothing. He says it's probably clear that Powell didn't really know any about the family because he was unable to spot that Mrs. Powell was, in fact, Mr. Williams dressed up in drag at the time. So he clearly doesn't know that. He said, are you going to break into a property, rummage around in the house until you find a key, which you don't know it happens to belong to a safe, which you also don't know is in the premises. And he said, it, it seems to indicate to him that there was it, that the crime was, was perpetrated by somebody within the house. Because even as, you know, Shepard, Inspector Shepard says, the window shows that it was broken out of. What is also interesting is under the window, there are a pair of 
muddy boot prints, um, which only under the window, which he's again indicates that somebody goes out of the window uh, onto the grass, cross the last, it, they've had a stormy night, it's all muddy. They then come back in, take their boots off and stay in the house. Now that is very intriguing because it means that somebody either faked the robbery, took the documents, took them out and handed them over to somebody else and then came back in, which is possible. He also points out that the boots have never, the boot prints have never ever been found to actually be imprints that could have been made by Gill. And it's so there's all sorts of little holes in the case. Um, he makes an impossible defense about him having the articles, though, because he gets charged with burglary and receiving stolen goods by saying, like, well, it's the same as if you'd lost your watch and you put an advert in the paper and somebody said, um, could I have a, you know, if you return my watch, I'll give you 50 pounds. So he had found the documents, gave them, I mean, it doesn't work at all, basically. Mm. So after all this argument around the case and who does what and how it happens, um, Gill does, does, get, does get acquitted of the charge of burglary because the jury don't think they can actually prove that he did the burglary. But he does get convicted of um, basically uh, of receiving stolen goods. Now, the judge is extremely annoyed about all of this. <laughs> basically, he's very unhappy about the whole business. So he says, obviously, he'll be a very bad person, a bad person to have done this sort of thing. Uh, it was, uh, Mrs. Powell's house, and the bad feature of the case is that you probably connected yourself with some discharged servant of Mr. Powell, and being a bad person and accustomed to rob from your early youth, you arranged with him and got information from him as to the position of the property, so as to enable you to commit the robbery in a very clever manner, calculated to conceal the real facts of the case. Now, there's no evidence for that at all. Actually, this summing up is nonsense. There isn't any evidence to support anything the judge says about this. Other than the fact, it becomes more and more evident as you go through this that there is somebody else involved with Gill in this. Um, it's also, I mean, he does get, you know, let he doesn't, he gets get acquitted for the charge of burglary. Um, though something he does come up, he's actually also only on another charge for burglary, and he had, in fact, been burgling at least 19 properties elsewhere <laughs> and and i think as you told me early on just as we started his father also gets arrested for burglary yeah, it's so, a family trade it's a family trade it's quite interesting though that you've got carvers and gilders who go into house to do the fancy carving and the gilding yeah casing the joint at the same time and then going back and burglaring it yeah, later. yeah, yeah. Oh, so so gill at the age of 19 gets a sentence for 12 years hmm. penal servitude for handling uh, stolen goods. But there is still, again, this problem about what happens with the burglary. How is it set up? Now, surprisingly, later on, after everything is convicted, Gill decides he has to come clean to Mr. Thomas Powell Jr., the eldest son. So they have an interview and they talk about it. And he says he has to make a clean breast. He talks about again how they set they set the crime up, how they look through it. They see an open window. They get in through the back in an open window, um, look around the property. But continually through, and he's talking about it, he calls using the word we <laughs> all the time. So <laughs> Powell, Mr. Powell says, well, I'm around, look, who is this we? You keep using we all the time. <laughs> we, I mean, oh, I, I mean, I. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I meant me, which is obviously, you know, grammatically a bit problematic because you don't say we broke into the house to me broke into the house. So he goes on and then the word we crops up again. And eventually Powell says, look, it's got to have been somebody else with you, possibly an older hand in these matters. But then ultimately he says, no, he says, I have made a solemn oath that I will not say who was with me and I am not going to break my oath now. And as far as we know, he never did. Yeah. But there is something interesting, again, because even the idea of the brothers Laverna always indicates there's more than one person involved because they're yeah. brothers, plural. But Laverna is the goddess, Roman goddess of thieves. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that indicates to me that the person who chose that was sufficiently educated in the classics, shall we say, to understand that, to know mm. that. Yeah. Now, that's that's not commonplace. But also you're left you're left with the big question about the boot marks under the window. And that's mm. the question that doesn't go away at any point in this, because if they show somebody went out the window, as Shepard says, they broke out. 
it also shows somebody came back in and stayed there which means it was somebody in the house mm. that was involved in setting this all up and that's we never shall, resolved we shall never know Jill never says we'll never know it must have been a very odd for the powell family though to carry on with servants in the house well, again, it's actually somebody who was pretty educated as well, which is, again, possibly even more than so. There was somebody in the house involved. That must have been a very odd atmosphere to live in, I knowing this fact. I think you're right. Oh, yeah. the Brothers Laverna. The Brothers Laverna. I, I prefer them to the Van Brothers of earlier on, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yes. There's a, there's a certain flair to the Brothers Laverna. <laughs> wow. Well, um, uh, Thomas Jr. you mentioned, Goff. Here he is with his wife, uh, Julia. Uh, oh, God. Phillips Jenkins of Killian and little John Llewellyn. Oh, I'm afraid... A, I must say, I'm sorry, this isn't kind, but that's a very ugly child. I really, really want you to be kind here, Goff. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, this is going to a dark, <laughs> dark place. This is why you can't take Goff out. Not that anyone can go out these days. <laughs> No, I'm afraid what happened to the three boys from the gear, so to speak, the three sons yeah. of Thomas Powell, was uh, quite extraordinary. Thomas Jr. in 1869 yeah. with Julia and little John Llewellyn. I'm not going to edit this, you know, Goff. Um, <laughs> they headed off to Abyssinia uh, to do some shooting and all three were massacred by bandits. Oh, my God. You're regretting <laughs> that now, aren't you? Yeah, all well, three. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, they, just, they massacred an ugly child. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I think you should stop digging, Goff, while, while you're here. Uh, yes, all three. Oh, gosh. All three terrible. were tragically oh, killed. Gosh. Oh, gosh. Um, so that was what happened to Thomas Jr. Um, a younger brother, Henry, went out to get the bones and bring it back. And they're yeah. buried at uh, St. Basil's Church, Bayslake, which is where their father is buried. Oh, right. Um, also along there was Walter Powell, who is my favourite Powell, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, here's Walter Powell. Uh, Walter Powell was a uh, brother of Thomas Jr. And Walter Powell, after his dad died in 1863, he moved away from the gear and moved away from Newport and he moved to Malmesbury. And he became MP there at the age of 26. And he was an enormously popular MP. He had imagination. Somebody suggested that it was from his father, now, that seems a bit strange that this generosity came from, because apparently he remembered when there was a terrible explosion at one of his dad's mines towards the end of Thomas Senior's life, and it really shook the old man. Oh, no. So much so, I'm, I'm not saying it was a Scrooge type, uh, you know, a sort of renewal and a redemption, but he did immediately make sure that those that survived had an income each week and a house. Oh, gosh. And it was said that... Uh, that Walter saw that and thought, well, I've got to be useful and helpful. And he's very imaginative. So, so the poor farmers of Malmesbury, he volunteered to pay for them to go to South Africa if there were opportunities there. So very popular man, yeah. but easily bored, perhaps, because uh, in 1880, he takes up ballooning. Yeah. It's Charles Stewart Rolls again, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. It's, 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 it's bad for ballooning amongst the, uh, the ruling families of this area. It's quite interesting. <laughs> 1880, I guess you're talking almost sort of 20 years before uh, Rolls was at it. And oh. uh, he'd moved to a place called Little Summerford, which is near Chippenham. And he got a man called Henry Coxwell, who had the record then of the highest ascent without oxygen, to train him. But Coxall said after a while, I and mean, he's got too much spirit. He needs someone else can train him. Oh, so, so obviously Walter Powell was a bit daring, you know. Yeah. Um, so he had lots of these balloon rides. On, on one occasion, he wanted to, to uh, ride from Kent to France in 1880, okay? He knew he went wrong because at 10 p.m. that night, he was over Exeter. <laughs> <laughs> be a bit tricky. <laughs> Here's one of his balloons, the Eclipse, and you can't see him, but this oh, is at the Cross Hayes in Malmesbury. It still looks exactly yeah. the same. And he's going up. The Eclipse balloon had a, an unfortunate history because in later years it was sold to a man who had a theory about balloons that yeah. if you boiled them with soda and then re-varnished them, it will be far better for them. 
No, it okay. turns out if you boil a balloon yeah. uh, in soda and then re-varnish it, it almost certainly will explode. <laughs> There was a British army officer in India who wanted to test theories about parachuting, who sent back to Britain for a balloon and was unfortunately sent the eclipse, which had been boiled by the balloon boiler. And it, when he went up above Bombay, it exploded and he died. The balloon boiler himself died when one of his balloons, surprise, surprise, exploded and he went up in it. So the eclipse... <laughs> The eclipse had a very bad history, this balloon yeah. you can see here. Uh, but clearly Walter Powell was very good with balloons. And that is why a man called Captain James Templer on December the 10th, 1881, asked for help from Walter Powell MP. You see, there was a peculiar fog over London. And the Met Office said, could Captain Templer, who is seen as the godfather of the RAF, he was involved in um, airships and things like that at the oh. period, could he go in a balloon over London and have a little look and record his observations for the Met Office? And the War Office gave him a free balloon and it was called the Saladin. Oh. So he thought, well, I'm, I'm going to need somebody to sort of pilot the balloon to, to all, you don't really pilot these things actually, to uh, look after the balloon yeah. uh, while I'm having a look above the clouds in London, you see. So he asked Walter. Uh, Walter by now has had a lot of balloon rides. He said, well, if you can do that, I'll come along. And for some reason, another man came along for a laugh, apparently. <laughs> Mr. Ag Gardner, who was brother of the Chippenham MP, just came along for a laugh. <laughs> so the three of them set yeah. out uh, from Bath. I mean, you're, you're trying wow. to <laughs> look over London. Bath Gas Works what? is where they what? set off from. So they fire up this balloon. The three of them, two useful yeah. and one ag gardener, gets into the basket. <laughs> well, yeah. One human ballast. One human <laughs> ballast. I'll be the first one to throw him over. And, uh, <laughs> and they're not using hydrogen or helium. They're using uh, coal gas. So what you've got, you've got ballast, as you say, to you know, throw over the side to go higher. And you use the little valve on the neck if you want to, you know, to let uh, gas yeah. out, if you want to go lower. That's the idea. So they set off from Bath to London. At least that was the idea. Um, they have problems when uh, they, first of all, they pass over, uh, they end up passing over Glastonbury. So they've reached Glastonbury. They've gone over there. Uh, and they know they're in trouble when Captain Templar hears the roar of the sea. <laughs> they can't see anything because the conditions, oh. they shouldn't have been yeah. up in this balloon. And they realize that they're close to being swept out to sea. They're close to the coast. This has yeah. all gone wrong. At this point, Walter Powell does not help when he throws some ballast over and the balloon speeds up. <laughs> Walter Powell says, I'm afraid I rather overdid that last ballast. <laughs> By this point, Mr. Ag Gardner's probably regretting coming on this jolly. <laughs> And Captain Templar decides they're going to have to land near Bridport quickly, land the, the thing. We are in deep, yeah. deep trouble here. So yeah. they go to land it, and it is a massive smash. They hit the ground. Oh. Mr. Ag Gardner, who's in yeah. straight form, you can see there, <laughs> is thrown from the basket. He breaks his leg, oh, and fractures his arm, so he's lying yeah. there. Yeah. Templar gets out of the balloon. Powell is still in it. Templar grabs the valve line, and for a while, like a Western, he is dragged along the ground by this yeah. thing. It's eight foot above the ground. He screams at Walter Powell, jump out. Walter Powell doesn't. Templar said, if only I could have got the valve line in my teeth, yeah. I yeah. might have stopped it, but he couldn't. It rips through his hands. Ooh. He lets go. Powell, for whatever reason, which isn't decided on, just waves at him. And the balloon disappears out to sea. Oh By God. the way, there you go. There's Ag Gardner again yeah. lying around. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's, disappear he's disappeared on Saladin, the balloon. Good God. And he is never seen again. Good God. Yet another oh, wow. tragedy for the Powell Gare boys. Yeah. 
This becomes a massive thing. Straight away, Templar telegraphs the Royal Engineers to get a steamer out to see if they can rescue him. He contacts the Coast Guard, the Harbour Master at Bridport. And there was a steamer put out. You can see the steamer here. Yeah. They found they find no real sign of him at all. And this goes on for three weeks, uh, this, this sort of thing. Three weeks. And it becomes a nationwide sensation or an international sensation. Charles Fort was fascinated by this, who started the Fortean Times. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. The what is interesting it was? The Spectator magazine didn't help themselves by saying after two weeks, well, <coughs> if he's still floating around, it's a corpse by now. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice for the family. <laughs> Two years later, according to the New York, New York Times, parts of the Saladin were found in the mountains of Sierra del Pedrosa in the northwest of Spain. But there was no sign of a body. We don't know what happened to Walter yeah. Powell. It is assumed that he fell out somehow into mm. the channel. Uh, lost at sea was the official um, verdict, but yeah. nobody knows. Of course, the question, Goff, is why didn't he jump yeah. when it was eight foot? Yeah. I mean, why didn't he? Did he freeze? Well, the trouble is, he may have, like a lot of uh, somebody who had experience of doing it, he maybe thought he could actually bring it under control again. That he hadn't given up attempting to bring it under control. Yeah, now, some say that because... he doesn't seem to be worried about it. He just sort of waves, doesn't he? Wait, yeah. oh, hey, bye. You know, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, and I, I, think, <coughs> I think he wanted to become a hero by saving the war office's balloon. Yeah. And I think that would well, have made him. Yeah. It may not even, that sounds a little bit sort of calculated. He may have just thought he, 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 he could bring it back under control. I don't, you know, I, I, yeah. But um, yeah, you're yeah. probably kinder than, than me on that. It's very sad, actually. He does have, he was so popular in Malmesbury, he does have a primary school named after him today. Oh, Walter yeah. Powell Primary. And there used to be a pub in the little village, little Summerford, called the Saladin. Oh, hey. the oh But gosh. sadly, yeah. showing yeah. no, I mean, they saved the pub. Well done, that village. Brilliant. They saved yeah. the pub, reopened it, and changed the name from Saladin to the Summerford Arms. My word. No, I, I <laughs> disapprove. I, dis <laughs> I disapprove too. Summerfield Arms. Anyway, yeah. this is. You uh, have to start a campaign. Bring Get back the Saladin. Yeah. <laughs> this is the Powell I hope they Grave. Have a picture of the Saladin balloon in there somewhere. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, this is St. Basil's Bay's leg, and this is the Powell family crypt. Oh, right. And if we have a look at it, it is, as you can see there, it is the main man himself, Thomas Powell and his wife, Anne. And then you get into the sad Thomas Jr. massacred yeah. in Abyssinia. They don't pull their punches, do they? No. Uh, and they've even got a bit about the balloon. You can see the balloon there, lost at sea. So it's a memorial oh, yeah. to, uh, to all of them. The third gear uh, boy, uh, Henry, actually died from a horsing accident fell off his horse and he died prematurely as well. So you've got a balloon. Yeah. You've got killed by bandits and you've, yeah. and you've got, um, a, you know, a ma um, falling off a horse. <laughs> Not a lucky family, are they? they were <laughs> it, all went, it all went down after the Brother Laverna. That's all you can say. It's all it downhill the after Laverna. the Brothers Laverna. There's a very sad memory I managed to find on uh, the Malmesbury Memories website, who uh, about 10 years ago, an elderly lady in, in Malmesbury said she remembers when she was a girl, there was an elderly gentleman who'd lost his memory, so whether it was Alzheimer's or whatever. And he used to walk around Malmesbury looking up at the sky. And sadly, and he used to say, yeah. my master went away in a balloon and he hasn't come back. Oh, God. So when he had oh, Alzheimer's, well, that yeah. memory was the one thing oh, that continued. Very oh, sad. Isn't he it? must have been one of the servants. Uh, you'd have thought so, yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. The gear continued. Uh, first of all, it was owned by a man called uh, Daniel Whitehouse, who spent most of his time, he was there for 30 years, and he spent most of his time being angry at people in an amiable way, if you believe the newspapers, <laughs> for stripping his orchard at the gear bear. They kept yeah. stripping this orchard, and he was angry as a magistrate in an amiable way. <laughs> 
But this is the more important one because after White House in, died in 1894, Charles David Phillips took over. You can see him looking jaunty there. And as you yeah. can see, Charles David Phillips started off at Gervach. He started oh, yeah, off as a farmer at Little Gear. Oh, right. So <coughs> then he, he was promoted to the big house. Yeah. And there he is at, again, Gervach mm. with Mr. Perrett of Tredega House. Oh. Uh, Godfrey Viscount Tredega said of Mr. Phillips that he was the most active man in Monmouthshire. Oh, There's God. a painting of Godfrey in the side hall at Tredega House, uh, which was spearheaded by Mr. Phillips. He was head of the committee that sorted it out. He's in his red jacket, those of you who know Tredega House. Oh, oh yes, that's what, yeah. So that was down so, to uh, Mr. Phillips. That was presented after he, uh, Godfrey was made free man of the town of Newport, I believe, that picture. Spot on. Uh, Phillips uh, was indeed active, in the words of Viscount Tredega, uh, mm. very much so, because he wasn't just a farmer. I mean, he was involved in all, he was an early car owner in the Charles uh, Rolls kind of fashion. He was a mechanical engineer. Um, oh, and, and Excuse he, me a moment, Paul. Oh, dear. I need to go and turn off my telephone. Oh, you do that while I talk about Charles Phillips. Uh, Charles Phillips uh, was the owner of the Emlyn Engineering Works. Now, if you want to know where the Emlyn Engineering Works and what they did, they repaired locomotives and they made uh, hauling engines and foundry core ovens. They were a big firm. And that's where the Kingsway Centre now is in Newport. That's why we've got an Emlyn Road in Newport Town Centre, because that's oh, where really? Phillips had his Emlyn Engineering Works. You also found a little magazine called Phillips Monthly Machinery Register. The Phillips <laughs> family did stuff. <laughs> I mean, they were extremely active. And they started off at uh, Little Gear, which you can see a wonderful picture of here. There's Little Gear. Mm. Keep an eye on that turret because it's still here today. And Little Gear is the Gear. Oh, pub. well, well, well. Good Lord, I've seen that many a time. I never read that. Oh, well, well. Now, this is why oh. so many people mix up the Gear house with Little Gear, yeah. including Wikipedia. This is not the mansion of Thomas Powell. This is Little Gear Farm for yeah. the Gear Estate, uh, which is still here. Mm. And here's the Phillipses. Um, a, a nice bunch. There's Charles, Charles D. Yeah. Phillips, a man who uh, made a lot, of, a lot of himself. There's his son, Charles, who later became, uh, he ran a farm in uh, Marshfield Church Farm and was an auctioneer. He was involved in the sale of Rupera Castle or the attempted sale in the 1930s and oh, helped gosh. the Tredega estate with the sale of the Tredega estate. And can you see this name? It says Goff. Oh only, yeah. Only one F. Yeah. That's Godfrey Phillips who took over after 1912 when oh, the big yeah. man died. I'm afraid he died in 1922 in tragic circumstances. He was at Llandridnod oh. Wells, looked out of his room at a hotel, felt faint and fell through a veranda. Oh my died God. Died of falling. God. I know, not very pleasant, is it? I, I never, you know, I did, perhaps rather naively, because Godfrey is not a terribly common name. Um, it's amazing. I, every Godfrey I come across is subsequently called Goth. Yeah, it seems and to be short say, even, you know, Lord, Lord Godfrey, Lord Jadiga was called Goth by his family, and, it, and, and this Godfrey is called Goth as well. Isn't that fascinating? Never really. Yeah. Well, after Lord Jadiga, by the way, the Godfrey you mentioned, bought the whole gear house and mansion in 1907. Oh, um, so he bought it. And uh, so it became part of the Tredega estate. It's so close to Tredega. It's not too yeah. surprising, is it? And so after the Phillips moved out, uh, what do you do with it in the 20th century? Well, we come to 1924 and they decide to it's bought or leased at least to become a school. And that's what happened to the gear. Oh, right. Uh, this man, W.J. Hamilton Jones, it was a family affair. He was known uh -huh. as Big Bill because he was a weightlifter as a young man. Oh, gosh. So Bill, Big Bill was the principal. His son was the headmaster. Two of his sons were teachers and two of the daughters helped look after borders and did some teaching as well at what now became called Gwent College. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's a private uh, school. Yeah, um, exactly. Ages seven to 19, um, their motto was a healthy mind and a healthy body. <laughs> and we know the fees in 1939 were 30 guineas a, a year for day pupils, 100 guineas for boarders. By 1954, it was 60 pounds a year for day uh, pupils. Mm. 
And there it is. There's still Gear House. As you can say, destroyed, demolished in the 1960s. Yeah. But they did have some nice facilities there. Yeah, this has disappeared, hasn't it, Goff? This area oh, of yeah. water. Good Lord. Called the lake, but it was essentially a pond, as you can see, yeah. with pupils in it. <clears throat> uh, there was great. What they didn't do was have a lot of heating in this school. It does seem to be the way it works with schools in the 1950s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what Don't they would do is... Keeping them warm. <laughs> when, when Big Bill saw his students sort of almost fainting with cold, he would say, round the wood! And all the <laughs> students would get up and run around the wood about a quarter of a mile run yeah. around gear wood, come back, and that'll be all, that'll keep them going for another hour. <laughs> and then he would say, round the wood again, and away they'd go. But it never occurred to him to just put some coal on the fire. Good <laughs> Lord, no. <laughs> Although for Powell's own old residence, you would have thought coal would have been the first thing at, the, at, the, at his yeah, memory. Quite. <laughs> so they had, by the time the Second World War comes, it, of course, there's not that many. There's about 12 boarders and 30 day boys. It's a boys' school uh, by that time. And then it ceases to become a school in about 19, in the, the late 1950s. Hmm. And uh, then, of course, the Gare Estate is upon us. Hmm. There were houses in the interwar years, but the big expanse came, of course, after the Second World War. And what you yes. can see in this picture, I'm not sure how clear it is, but here we've still got Gear Mansion. Oh, there the house. Yeah, the house is still standing. The house is still there, even though you've got all this around it. Harold yeah. Macmillan visited the Gear in 1952. Oh. He was he was a housing minister in Churchill's peacetime government. And the Gear Estate won a prize at the Festival of Britain. It won an award of merit in 1951. The oh. one problem I've got with the gear is when you look at the road names, it's Marlowe and it's Shakespeare and it's mm. Joyce. Not a single road or street name up the gear that has anything to do with the history of the gear itself. Oh, man. No Phillips, there's no White House, there's yeah. no Powell, for goodness sake. Yeah. So it's a, someone obviously doing the road names back then didn't really look into the history yeah. of the area. Um, I think the Gear Inn, when they reopen, should have a picture of salad in the balloon. Don't you think so? Yes, I think so. Well, it's interesting. Those are all prefabs as well. Oh, yeah. Well, immediately afterwards. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so they, again, it's part of that post-war surge of buildings, isn't it? You know, the, to prefabricate the prefabs. Seen as being temporary housing, but some of it lasted well, way, way, way up in like, the last 22 decades of the last century. Some of them are still going. Certainly did. And... Uh... And the mansion itself, although Gear, yeah. Gaia Vach is still there, but the mansion gone in the late 1960s. Mm. So that was the Gear. That was quite an intriguing one. Yeah. I think one of our. I, do, I just, I, well, yeah, I have no, I'm fascinated. And every like, game for a house you didn't know was actually ever existed. And I knew, I knew of Powell, but mm. I never knew of the property. Yeah. So it was just simply just demolished and, and built over. It was demolished. It remained for a while because kids in the area uh, knew it as the haunted house. <laughs> yeah. Derelict mansion. Of course, it's the haunted house yeah. of the gear. Would be, would it? <laughs> uh, but I would like, I mean, obviously, <clears throat> people say road names after aristocrats is a bit passe, even though he was the biggest coal exporter in the world. I'd quite like little touches, wouldn't you? The odd salad yeah. in the pub or something like yeah. that. I think that would yeah. be quite nice. It's, in, yeah, it's, in, it's interesting how you, especially how much uh, history and politics shape these things, isn't it, really? Mm. And what we think about them. Um, there are problems with being a, a coal master. Mm. They weren't necessarily the nicest people. Powell himself was a, an absolute bruiser of a man. True. You know, somebody wants to cut their wages by 15% is not necessarily that admirable. True, but you've got to use your imagination. You've got to embrace and mark the past. You've got to have yeah. a Laverna Lane. Yes, I would happy. <laughs> I would settle on Laverna Lane any day of the week. I, I have more, I have, I, I'm quite happy to celebrate the Brothers Laverna. Brothers Laverna. <laughs> and on that note, thank you very much, Goff. And we will see you next time wherever, like the Saladin, wherever we blow up. Blow up. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>